Hello everyone and welcome back to my office here at home. Um, it is Wednesday morning and so obviously I didn't get your lecture finished yesterday for uh, the week. However, um, some things come up on Tuesdays. As I told you, for some reason everything seems to hit the fan uh, on a Tuesday. So that's what happened yesterday and instead of being able to go into my office hours and do this video for you yesterday, um, I got trapped in the cycle of craziness that is the Christian County Library right now. So I apologize for being at those meetings last night, but um, you know, I figure if I'm supposed to teach you all this stuff, I should probably be able to know how to do it too. And so that takes, you know, a little bit of praxis and that's what I've been doing. I exercise that when I can. Hopefully you'll forgive me. I know that you all are taking your test, so the reading this week really is relatively light, and there's good reason for that. That's to give you the time to take um, or to focus on the exam, and hopefully you all are able to do that without any trouble. So today though, we, yesterday, we're scheduled to talk about Francis Bacon, and this is where we start to introduce something a little bit different. I know that I told you that during the ancient Greek period, it was really sort of this debate between rhetoric and truth. During the Roman period, it was this struggle between rhetoric and power, that relationship. During the medieval period, it was really about the church or religion and rhetoric. And then during the um, late medieval period um, and the early renaissances, we start to pull in two new parts of that sort of struggle that rhetoric has with the world. And that is the artistic or the aesthetic and science or what they refer to as reasoning. So. I think that the question of what's the difference between reasoning and science could come at a different time in a different course. I don't think that's worthy of having it right here for you all. That's not as important. Just know that whenever they say reasoning, they're talking about the form of science that was available to them at the time. And so, as I told you last time that we uh, met like this, that we would be looking at this split, thanks to Ramus, between rhetoric and reason or between speech and science if you will and uh, we're going to be doing that today we're going to be leaning heavily on the side of science specifically we're going to be looking at a little bit of psychology um, a particular kind of psychology and also some of the things that limit us in science just by virtue of us being human so let's dive into Francis Bacon. Francis Bacon has two main works that I had you read. The first one is called, um, I don't remember what the first one is called. How terrible is that? I know that the second one um, is uh, the Nova Morgana, but okay, the first one is the Advancement of Learning. I did not want to be incorrect. Um, the Advancement of Learning is where he introduces the concept and idea of faculty psychology. Now, as odd as it might seem, faculty psychology is not the psychological issues that your faculty has, although it could be, but instead we're using the term faculty here in terms of the parts of the brain or, that's for Bacon, or the, the ability um, to do something. So, old phrases that you probably haven't heard, I'm losing my faculties, meaning that I'm unable to do the things that I've been able to do in the past, or I don't have the faculty for that, which for me, I don't have the faculty for math. Um, that was not something that was given to me when they were handing out, you know, math intelligence. I'm terrible at it. Or I do have the faculty for being able to read and absorb information quickly. So what, what we might just consider characteristics or skills or abilities, that's what we're really talking about with faculties. So when Francis Bacon is talking about faculties, what does he mean? First of all, 
He's talking about them in the terms of these skills. But he's also saying, and, and this was a little bit radical for the time, and it's not purely the way that we think about this now, okay? This is sort of part of where our study of neurosciences comes from, very rudimentarily. Um, he talks about different sections of the brain having different faculties in them, okay? So we're not all born with the exact same brain, we're born with different faculties. Those different faculties might be um, similar with some and not similar with others. Most of them you're born with and then you have to practice in order to build on the skill. Math, for example, wherever that occurs in the brain, in me, um, either is non-existent or didn't develop depends on your point of view, I think. Uh, but one of the things that he said were, fa or two of the things he said that were faculties is both rhetoric and reason. That the ability to reason is a separate faculty from the ability to practice rhetoric. And that's okay. Um, because he says that we can develop multiple faculties or we can be given the gifts of multiple faculties all at once. And so if somebody kind of loses their mind, um, you know, back in my dad's day, they used to say I've lost my marbles or she's losing her marbles or they're learning, losing their marbles. But um, then we kind of got into, and that, that actually, I think originates in Peter Pan, I'm not positive, but what they meant was losing my faculties. In teaching, in education, my grandmother used to tell me that it was always about whether or not students had the faculty to do what they needed to do. Do they have the skill to write? Do they have the faculty of reading comprehension, etc.? In the 1980s, um, we started saying things a little bit differently. Uh, there's a common phrase from REM, famous band, I'm not going to presume you've ever heard of them, but I love them, uh, probably because I'm an 80s kid. Uh, but R.E.M. had a song called Losing My Religion. And when the writer of that song was asked, what do you mean by that? Um, he said it's the idea just you're like losing your mind a little bit or you're losing what you know to be right and what you know to be wrong. You're misstepping in some way. These days, when that happens to me, and I want to say I'm losing my faculties or I'm losing my marbles, um, I say something more like, uh, sorry, I'm a few fries short of a happy meal today. Um, or, you know, that person is a few chicken nuggets away from a full six pack, whatever it is. We say these sorts of things that reference pop culture as a way of saying, you're losing your abilities, your faculties, you're confusing um, faculties. Now, this is not to be mistaken with like when you get angry. Uh, when I say I'm losing my cool, I usually mean I'm not able to calm down because I'm angry. I'm losing my cool. I'm getting hot. My Irish is getting up. We have all these phrases. Well, when we're talking about particularly skills and faculties and such, Bacon says there's a portion of the brain that is assigned to each of those things. Some of you may have heard over your lifetime that the way that we tell if people are lying is that they look up and to the left. And that is not universally true, by the way. But the reason they say that is because when you're trying to remember something, that lives in the frontal lobe of your brain. And so you'll look up and you'll think to yourself, okay, I know I remember what this is supposed to be. It's got to be in there somewhere. I'm looking for it, right? We do that. Some psychologists and, stu and, and sort of studies that have been done on nonverbals and body language say we look up and to the left when we're lying. I am not lying right now, so it's possible to do this when you're not lying, but... Um, and so people who have studied nonverbal behavior and sort of these tics that we have say that you can 
tell that you're lying because what's up here in this area is your creative abilities. And now that I'm telling you this, I'm trying to remember if I actually got those right, but I believe I did. Um, <laughs> the right side is the memory and the left side is more like making up stories. And so we tend to move our eyes and our head away from eye contact and to where we think we need to look. And that's driven by where some of these things are stored. You know what? I'll bet math is like really far back here or something and like in the back of my skull where I can't see. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm bad at math. Um, anyway, so this idea of dividing the brain up into different faculties suggested a couple of things that Bacon talks about. The one that's probably the most important to us is that he says that we can be born with the faculty of rhetoric and we can be born with the faculty of reason, but he separates these two out just like Ramus did. Now that will change when we get to the next piece by Bacon, but um, you know, what can I say? This also is very dangerous to think that there's parts of the brain that control something 100% and 100% of the time and we can't manipulate that. That led to something very dangerous in the 1940s to the 1950s and that was the lobotomy. When women were defined as hysterical when they were defined as having some mental problem where they acted out and they didn't behave properly, uh, they would give them lobotomies, which essentially was cutting out the frontal lobe, I believe it's the frontal lobe of the brain, um, as a way to make it better. These failed. Just in case you're curious, I don't know I, maybe there's a successful story out there, but I think that cutting out part of your brain, it, it would really cause like, you know, serious tra trauma and problems for your body um, in how you work, in how you process things, in how you remember things. And, and it seems to me like it would make it worse. But um, thankfully, uh, while there were way too many lobotomies that were actually performed, thankfully, we learned our lesson as quickly as we could. And by we, I, not me, I wasn't alive. Uh, by me, I mean, by we, I mean the 30s, well, really the 40s and 50s. Um, I really think by the late 1950s, it was no longer a practice because it was not considered humane. So a lot of people will say, well, Francis Bacon is the reason why we have lobotomies. Um, that is not true. It was an extrapolation from his idea that let's say that you had a faculty that was really problematic for you. For example, that you were hearing voices. They might think that that came from your memories or that it came from your creative side of your brain. Cut it out. You'll be fine. I'm not really sure how anybody thought that this was okay, but they did it. And it's a part of our history that I'm not very proud of. I don't think anybody's ever gone in and said, I need you to cut out the part of my brain that has rhetoric in it. I don't think that ever happened. But um, the idea that we are born with and given certain skills and other people are not leans back on the fact that Cicero and others say that you can be born with the skill of oratory. But if you don't hone it over time, then you won't be able to utilize it. And they also say that some people are not born with the ability to practice rhetoric, to speak well, to reason well. Um, and those people, the question was, can they ever become good at it? Uh, I would obviously argue yes. I think others would argue no. Um, and that's just not a worthy debate. It's not important in my opinion. But Francis Bacon here is giving us one part of a possible argument. Okay. And that's essentially what faculty psychology is about. And that's essentially what his work on the advancement of learning is about. The idea that we could learn better by understanding how the brain works. Okay. The second piece that I had you read is definitely the more interesting of the two. 
because this is where reasoning and science start to get confused. And let me explain what I mean by that. First of all, when they were talking about science, they were talking about empirical science. What is empirical science? Empiricism is the idea that you can know the world through your senses. And just in case you're curious, yes, we do have more than five senses. But empiricism is really about those main five of sight, smell, hearing, touching, or feeling. Um, wow, I always miss one. Sight, smell, touch, hearing, and smelling. That's what the fifth one is. Uh, that those five are the core ways that we come to know the world, essentially. Um, we observe things. We listen to things. I, I mean, if you're into botany, smelling things, and if you're into uh, chef work, smelling things is very, very important. Um, obviously, touching and feeling things in order to understand their form and their texture and their density, for example. They didn't have all of the machinery that we have now that would allow them to test these things without actually using the five main senses. For those of you who are wondering if I'm like talking about like sixth sense, like the movie or clairvoyancy, no. Um, but think about this, for example, you have a sense of time passing. You have a sense of your body moving. In fact, that's so much a sense that there is actually, and I have this, but I couldn't tell you what it's called, um, people who don't, aren't able to know where their body is in relation to other objects. So oftentimes I'm hitting my hip on a desk or I'm kicking a door open uh, with, with my foot and I miss um, various different ways that we sense our body, space and time are senses that we have. We also can sense things like the wind. Is that because we feel it, because we hear it, or is there some other way that we can sense that? Um, and so there's, there's different senses in that, in, in, in that way. Okay, I'm not talking like, let's talk about contacting the other side and bringing ghosts into the world or anything. But literally, we, we do. We have way more than just five senses, okay? Um, and, but we don't talk about that. When we're talking about empiricism, we're talking mainly about those, those five main senses and nothing else. And that was their form of science. Okay, so those would be inartificial proofs. That's what Aristotle would call in artificial proofs. You know, the fact that I am wearing a sweater today because it's finally fall, I think. Maybe it's a false fall, but it feels and smells like fall out there. Um, but my sweater is pink. And when I'm looking at it on my computer right now, it looks white. Um, why is that the case? If we took a poll, am I wearing a pink sweater or a white sweater? I would imagine that, you know, most of you might say white. Okay, I would say white with the way that it looks on the camera, but I know that it's pink. Um, so we perceive things differently, even when we're using our five main senses. And that is an important note for Bacon. It should also be noted that before the scientific method was named, it was called the Baconian method. And it was inductive. Bacon believed that you went out and you selected a different, or you observed, excuse me, you observed all these different instances of things. In fact, the way he died was trying to freeze. I, it was some sort of fowl. Uh, it wasn't necessarily a chicken, more likely a goose or something like that. Um, he was trying to see if it would freeze in the weather, uh, in the in the snow, and. So he did that with a few different fowl, I guess. And that's actually how he ended up getting sick and dying, uh, which, you know, he died doing what he loved, I guess. But that inductive idea of going out and experimenting on one or a few things and then drawing a general principle from that induction was known as the Baconian method. 
We have since moved to what we call the scientific method, which is inherently deductive. We make a claim and then we go out and test it. And either it's true or it's false. Um, so the scientific method is based off of the Baconian method uh, in a lot of ways. It inverts the way that we go about the study, but it's still using the same idea that we use um, empiricism in order to come up with our answers. Now, that empiricism looks slightly different these days because instead of just being able to use our eyes, we have telescopes and micro microscopes and um, various lenses that we can use to look at things, magnification, uh, and so on. I mean, we've got, um, what is it, uh, atomic microscopes now where like literally you can get down to the, the atom. Um, so there's some pretty advancing things that we've done, but it goes back to sight or sound, right? And we're constantly trying to refine our empirical senses. Now, of course, Bacon didn't, couldn't foresee that coming down the road. However, somebody else will, um, and we'll get there later. But Bacon did acknowledge that there were some things that might distract us from finding the truth. Now, a lot of us refer to that as different interpretations of the truth, but he was saying, no, there are things that limit our ability to know, okay? There are limits to the things that we can know because we have things just by being human characteristics that distract us from knowing what the truth is, what exactly it is that we're seeing, what exactly it is that we're feeling. He calls these the four idols, I-D-O-L-S. Now, this work is known as the Novum Organum. What does Novum Organum mean, Dr. Dudash? Well, it means new instrument. So he was literally talking about essentially an, an instrument that we would use to look for truth, just like, well, in his day, the telescope. Um, rudimentary. In his day, the, the math compass, maps, rudimentarily. Um, those things, he said, we see. Those are instruments of reason and science. But he says, hey, there's a new instrument that we need to consider utilizing as well. And this is where I think Bacon's brilliance is. For me, this is one of his most important works. I, he has a, he's had a lot. Um, but this is one of his most important works because it tells us why our different um, faculties, our different abilities, and our different uh, empirical interpretations might differ. So these four idols, I think about them like this. Idols um, can be, you know, good or bad, but in this case, these idols are bad because they distract us from knowing the truth. Okay, so look at it that way. Four idols. The first one is uh, known as the idol of the cave or the den. I'm not sure which one your book is using this year. They seem to switch between the two. Uh, either one is fine. I'll understand what you're talking about. Um, the idol of the cave or the idol of the den is sort of what it sounds like. It's our own personal world that we live in that sort of blocks us from seeing the rest of the world. I don't know about you. I do have a cave. This is my cave. Um, I've got my books. I've got some of my uh, dark academic um feel good pieces that you can't see right this second. I've got some travel uh, up on my walls um, and I've got a comfy chair over there. So this is my cave. When I close the door, my husband, um, my children, when they're around, they know don't bother mom um, because she's busy. And I might just be busy spending time with myself because sometimes you need a little bit of a break. 
we've heard terms like man cave and she shed and all these gendered ideas of what a cave or a den is. But essentially, it is where you go, where you are comfortable, where you don't have to think, where you don't have to do a lot for the human comfort. And so you settle in and you feel good about it. Well, in terms of coming to know and understand, what does that mean? It means that we get too caught up in our own individual caves or our own individual dens and we don't see past them. And when we can't see past that thought, we can't truly understand what we're supposed to be learning. The second idol is the idol of the tribe and the idol of the tribe now i actually think this is in a different order in your book again order does not matter here okay so in this case order does not matter um the idol of the tribe is the idea that we're all i hope you're sitting down human and the tribe that we belong to is the human tribe now think about this humans are inherently limited. We are limited by time. Our eyesight is limited. Um, some of us have better eyesight than others. Some of us see different colors than others. Uh, for me, if um, you ever had LASIK surgery, uh, for me, there's a permanent sort of goggling effect on my eyes whereby I see right here sort of a um, like these curved lines essentially that demark where they cut my eye um, and those will probably never go away and that's okay but I never had them before I don't know what that does for me it definitely makes my um, my closer vision my reading vision horrible but I can read street signs now so that's exciting right um, and anybody who's had LASIK can tell you that they may or may not have the goggle effect because that doesn't always happen. Um, but they will be able to tell you that their vision has changed, right? And so we all have different vision. We're limited by time. We're limited by vision. I don't. I, I am diabetic. Um, I think I've mentioned that before. And I don't have any feeling in my feet. Um, and some of the feeling in my fingers has diminished. So I can pick up a hot pot on the stove and not even think twice about it. My husband's like, what are you doing, right? Because he feels that heat more than I feel that heat. So an empirical way of looking at the world or touch is through touch. And my touch is different from everybody else's, most likely. But that's probably true for all of us. But we are limited. So we are limited in multiple ways. I could sit here and go on forever. And we believe, somehow, that we see all of it, that we know, that we know for certain. And so this idol distracts us because it makes us think that we're certain and we're not. Even if we're using instruments like telescopes and microscopes and otoscopes and whatever the hell else scopes we've got, um, things that supposedly improve our vision, things that supposedly improve our ability to, to touch and understand, those things distract us from the fact that we are limited and we have to acknowledge that in some way. The third is the idol of the marketplace. And the idol of the marketplace literally means that we have to look at knowing, at logic, at reason, um, at science, as an exchange between humans. Um, I think my allergies are kicking up because it is in fact fall, and that makes me feel very good. Sorry, distraction there, I apologize. Uh, the idol of, of this exchange the in the marketplace what is it that we're exchanging what is the currency for exchanging for goods or for knowledge etc and that currency is language so our language limits us 
And we're going to hear this again repeated by uh, a few th theorists uh, over the course of the next week or so. Um, this idea that language limits us comes from a lot of different places. First of all, yes, there is the very basic fact that we don't all speak the same language, literally, right? Um, I try to, okay, I'm sorry, I'm going to admit, I really love Ricky Martin. I'm sorry if you don't know who that is, um, but I love him and he sings in English and he sings in Spanish. And I happen to think that he is awful with English songs, but is absolutely amazing when it comes to Spanish songs. And so even though I took this much Spanish when I was in high school, I will sing in Spanish. And most of the time I can figure out what he's saying, but <coughs> excuse me, once or twice I had a phrase and it was, it directly translated to, it's my fault, the air that you're not here. Makes no sense. And I asked uh, someone from Portugal, and I asked someone from uh, Mexico, and I asked someone from Spain. I said, what the hell does that mean? And all three of them, despite being from different places that speak slightly different Spanish, I asked, they all said the same thing, which was there is no way to translate that thought into English adequately. Um, so there, those differences in languages aren't just about a barrier of different languages, because obviously we could get translators, but it's because they don't translate exactly perfectly well uh, from one language to another. And then, of course, there's the idea that we have uh, different subculture languages, right? Different ways of saying things that people might not understand. Um, we also um, are limited by the number of words that we have, and they're arbitrary. What happens if we describe something that we see under the microscope as purple, when what we're really seeing is a completely new color that we don't have a word for, but the closest we can get to it is purple. So we say purple. So our knowledge is limited by the exchange that we make in the marketplace, that exchange being language. Hope that makes sense to you. It's harder to get to the truth when your language doesn't directly and perfectly accurately describe uh, what you're seeing or what you're thinking or what you're feeling and, and so on. Last but not least is the idol of the theater. And this is really culture. And it's your individual culture, how you were raised, what your family taught you, um, whether you were raised to believe certain things or not. Um, you know, for this one, it's always funny because it's not just your family. It's also the larger scope of, you know, maybe you grew up I mean, we all grew up with different families for sure, but maybe you grew up without the traditional family. Maybe you grew up in a group of like a commune kind of situation. So we're talking about those. And then for some of us, if you were raised in a particular religious way of thinking, then you have all of that as part of your culture. If you were raised in a, per, uh, a certain kind of thinking has nothing at all to do with religion, um, it has to do with what your parents' jobs were or what the jobs of people around you were, those who you admired. Um, my grandfather was a steel worker. My grandmother was a teacher. Uh, my other grandfather worked in scrap metal. Both of them were in World War II. And then my dad came out a lawyer. Uh, he went to Notre Dame to become a chemist and he came out a lawyer. So uh, this idea that the world is grounded in science and in empiricism um, came from my dad a lot, uh, despite his, um, his sort of contrarian nature. Uh, he also, you know, did not train me to be a lawyer uh, because the law is very strict. The law says this is what we do. And I am extremely pragmatic. I think I've mentioned this before. I, me and the law don't mix. Not, not like I want to disobey it, but just in the sense that it seems like it could be applied a little bit with some pragmatism instead of just 
as equally, the equal application of the law does not always give you the best result in my experience, right? That's my interpretation and that's why I'm not a lawyer, by the way, and that's okay. Um, but the way I was raised, the, the culture that I was raised in, the religion I was raised in, where I lived, where I live now, the education levels that I have or uh, lack thereof, um, you know, all of those things make a huge difference in what we believe we are finding out empirically, okay? Um, probably the best most simplistic example of this that I can give you is a lot of people down here. Well, I've lived a number of places, right? I've lived in Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Columbia, Missouri, Oklahoma, here and in Minnesota. Okay. I've lived a lot of places. Uh, and it always amazes me that whenever I go to some place, there's two things they tell me about the weather. One is it changes every five minutes. No matter where I go, if you don't like the weather in Cleveland, wait five minutes. If you don't like the weather in Pittsburgh, wait five minutes. If you don't like the weather in Springfield, wait five minutes. It will change. Everywhere says this except Oklahoma. They're pretty much just always the same. Um, but even in Minnesota, they would say this to me. And I was like, there's still snow on the ground. It hasn't changed that much. Uh, you know, it's... It's interesting because people's perceptions of how quickly the weather changes. That seems to be sort of a universal American thing. The second thing that they always say is, oh my gosh, is it humid here? We've got mosquitoes the size of Texas. Mosquitoes are the state bird. Like I, I have, I've heard that everywhere I go, <laughs> except Oklahoma. And I'm always like, what? This can't be right. I can't live in five out of six places or whatever it is and they all be exactly the same. But they all have these ideas because to them it feels humid in Minnesota. I'm sorry, it's not humid up there. It is dry. It is cold and it is dry. But for them it's humid. Uh, Columbia, the Columbia, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, DC line, uh, that, that latitude there, uh, is just a nightmare during the summer. You open up your front door, you try to walk out of it and you're hit with the humidity wall. Um, it's pretty rough and that's pretty bad. So when people down here, you say, oh my God, it's so humid. I'm like, well, I mean, it's a little muggy. <laughs> but it's not, it's not as bad as it could be, trust me. And so we all have different perceptions of what things look like, feel like, taste like, smell like, uh, sound like, based on how we were raised in it. Okay, so today what we learned about from Francis Bacon in the advancement of learning, we learned about faculty psychology and the idea that you are born with skills that they need to be practiced. From uh, Francis Bacon, um, we also get the four idols and the Novum Organum, which again means new instrument. And in there we find these four distractions that take us away from the truth. And if we can acknowledge those, then we're more likely to come to the truth. Okay, I hope that helps everybody. I believe that everything is up and running. Your grades should all be up. If you do not have a grade for something and that you're supposed to, again, please let me know. I, The last time I said this, I got an email saying that someone didn't have their grade and I looked at it and it's there for me. So if you're still not seeing that grade, please email me again and I will see what we can do. But everybody's grades should be up. Everybody should be able to access the exam. Again, you have until Monday at 11.59 p.m. that night to get your exam done and in. I would encourage you not to wait till the literally 11th hour to do this. I would encourage you to find some time between Wednesday and Monday, when you can sit down and give yourself about an hour, maybe at most, um, some of you will finish it more quickly. Uh, hopefully none of you um, need, you know, 
a lot more time than that. I, I don't intend to make you spend a ton of time on the exams. They are purely to make sure that you're reading and that you're watching the lectures. That's it. Um, last morning, I'm going to give you guys about the exams. And I think I've mentioned this before, but it's worth reminding. If you Google an answer, there is a heavy chance that you're going to get not all the points on the exam. The reason for that is, is that definitions and ideas should be put into context. And that's my job, is to put them into context for you. So if you Google what's Aristotle's definition of rhetoric, you're going to get a ton of hits. And they might be slightly different. It's the act of persuasion. It's the act of persuasion ethically. Um, it's persuading other people to do the good. And there's all sorts of, of definitions of rhetoric. Ours, in our context for our, our, our study, is the art or skill or know, of knowing in a particular instance all the means of persuasion. And there's no other answer. Because I want to emphasize to you all that that's as close to a translation of his original work as we can get that we know of. That's the first thing. But secondarily, for the purposes of this course, that is the definition that is correct to use. So I'm going to suggest that you not Google answers. Sometimes it'll be perfectly right, but you're probably better off just looking for it in your notes or in the lectures or in the book. All right, everybody, if you have any questions about the exam, let me know. I believe that next time for tomorrow, um, I want to make sure I'm right on this. Uh, yes, it is uh, the intro to modern rhetoric. Oh, I do have some heavy reading here. Um, Margaret Fells, Women Speaking Justified. Um, I'm going to go ahead and tell you to go ahead and push lock until after the exam. So not for Thursday, but for next Tuesday. So add lock onto your VICO reading for uh, October 1st, okay? Because I don't want you all to have heavy reading that I want you to concentrate on during your exam week. Okay, questions, comments, concerns, complaints, or threats, by all means, please let me know. And I will be talking to you tomorrow.